Hi, welcome. Welcome to a mini-me Patreon Q&A where I answer my patrons' questions in this Q&A. Uh, and if you want to ask your own questions, then you can either become a patron from a dollar a month, and you know, every couple of months I make a video like this, or you can just ask the question in the comments of this video and I'll try and answer it down there. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, there was no stream this last couple of weeks, uh, and that's because I've been pretty busy, I've been traveling a bit, and there probably won't be another stream for about a month. So apologies to those of you who love to listen or watch my streams on this channel, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm basically, I'll be overseas, I'll be traveling. Uh, regular videos will continue, and when I get back from traveling, I kind of want to ramp up my sort of streams in a way. I want to make them a little more polished than they are, although I know that sort of the complete shit show that are my streams is a part of their charm. And uh, also, I was at PAX last weekend and I just want to say, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone who came and said hi. It was really, um, it was really delightful. It was, it was kind of, it was the first time that I'd sort of made a public appearance as Mini-Me, as a, as a niche internet micro-celebrity. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was truly, um, special and memorable to me to meet, to meet some of you. And, and you're all very, you're all very delightful people. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful that I had that experience. So yeah, anyway, stop being sentimental. Stop sincere posting on main or on my second channel this is. Uh, into the questions, Luna Dalton asks, Hey Pete, if you could make a licensed game for any movie slash TV, what would it be? And what would the hypothetical company be that would develop it. For example, a Breaking Bad game by Telltale Games. I feel like I've answered variations of this question before, and I've mentioned such IPs as John Wick, which I'm very surprised doesn't have a good video game because John Wick Hex isn't very good. Uh, and likewise with Sopranos, I think I answered at one time mentioning The Sopranos, and also The Sopranos game isn't very good. So this time, this time I've come up with a new answer. I think this time, and this is a little more obscure than John Wick or The Sopranos, I recently watched a K-drama called Vincenzo, uh, and it's about an Italian-Korean gangster befriending, like, a bunch of local sort of store owners while taking down an evil pharmaceutical company. It's, it's this funny sort of, it kind of feels like a video game, you know? Vincenzo, this sort of leading man, keeps going on these different missions, sort of, to take down this evil company. It, it kind of feels like there's a lot of espionage and um, legal battle warfare stuff. It's just a really fun, sort of, tonally cheesy show. And uh, I, I think... <laughs> I think if Naughty Dog took on a Vincenzo video game, which would never happen, I think that could be that could be something quite magical. So there, there's 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 some it, it, there's there's basically a K drama recommendation in that answer. Uh, Aya asks, "Hello, what do you consider to be the best video game OST? Is there any so memorable that it just stays in rotation?" It's very hard to pick, right? And and like if we're going off. Um, licensed soundtracks, then I don't think, or, or really just soundtracks in general, I don't think that my personal music taste has been influenced by any other franchise as much as it has by Tony Hawk. The Tony Hawk games kind of dictated my entire childhood music taste uh, for a while there. But if we're talking about like original soundtracks, which I think is a more interesting thing to talk about, um, then I think that, I think that GoldenEye 007 on the N64 has one of the coolest soundtracks ever. Uh, the way that they took a tambourine and just took it down 10 octaves and made that like their motif drum beat is a lot of fun. Um, I think Alone in the Dark 2008 has an amazing soundtrack by Oliver de Riviere, I think is his name. I probably butchered that. Uh, Hitman Blood Money is really great. Oblivion's really great. Great, um... The indie game VVV VVV has a really great chiptune soundtrack that uh, stayed in my rotation for a while, but not many do stay in my rotation. I'm not a person who often listens to um, video game music, um, and I apologize for you know not coming up with a single best answer to this. But you know, there's so many there's so many great soundtracks. I really love Mafia's soundtrack and how it, it mixed an original score uh, with era specific songs and sort of created a very uh, strong atmosphere through its soundtrack. I think Hitman 2 has a great soundtrack. I think Assassin's Creed has a great soundtrack. I think Doom 2016 has a great soundtrack. Yeah, uh, it's it's hard. It's a hard one to answer, but thank you for asking. 
being cheeky, mate. I have a couple of questions for you. Have you ever played Ace Combat games? Uh, if so, where would you like to see the series go? If not, do you intend to play it one day? Second question, with the recent push for video game music by the algorithm, many are uncovering the beauty of PSX era music. Do you have a favorite console in terms of music? What are the producers you most look up to? Um, I've only briefly played the Ace Combat games, so I can't sort of uh, comment on where I want the series to go. I, I, I remember enjoying them. I think they're cool. I, I definitely want to play more of them, but yeah, no, I, I don't have an opinion really on Ace Combat. Uh, and I'm not sure I have a favorite console either. I feel like I'm giving a lot of non-answers today. Um, I, I agree with the general sentiment that the sort of 8-bit and 16-bit consoles with their sound cards produced a lot of... Uh, unique tunes that are that are sort of were born out of their limitations and have become iconic now like you know Mario and Castlevania and all those soundtracks are still very listenable and very amazing um, so if, if I had a favorite console in terms of music I would lean towards those um, I also really like this Sega Mega Drive and it's sort of really chunky sound chip and sort of uh, what's it called sound MIDI instruments. I can't think of the word I'm trying to think of, but yeah, the, the Mega Drive's really great. Um, and as far as composers go, I really like Jesper Kidd. I think his work on Hitman and Assassin's Creed, even though I don't really like Assassin's Creed as a franchise, and Freedom Fighters are amazing. He's, he's a Danish composer. Um, and yeah, I think, it's, I think it's worth going through and listening, especially to Assassin's Creed 1 and 2 and Hitman 2, the original Hitman 2, and um, Hitman Blood Money's soundtracks and, and, and sort of absorbing the atmosphere that are created by them. And then Freedom Fighters as well is, is quite a powerful soundtrack. So yeah, good question. Thank you for asking, or good questions rather. Antonio Phillips. How did you feel with how your Red Steel video worked out? It was a fresh change seeing you on camera and I personally feel it's one of your best yet, and that the changes were for the best. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I feel like it's one of the best that I've done as well. I'm really happy with it. I'm very proud of it. Annoyingly, it didn't sort of get as many views as most of my other videos do, which is, uh, you know, I put a lot more effort into it, so that's a bit painful, but the, it is what it is. Uh, I'm sort of hoping to make more videos in its vein. I feel like I followed it up with the Africa video, which didn't have me on camera, but I also feel like my writing in the Africa video was quite strong. And then I followed that up with the War of the Monsters video, which didn't really come out how I wanted it to, but by the time, you know, <laughs> by the time I'd sort of recorded it, I was like, yeah, I just got to edit this and put it out and move on with my life. Um, so yeah, I think, I think when it comes to how my channel has evolved, Actually, this ties into my next question, so I'm going to read that one out. Nicholas Wilson, what's next for you on the channel? I'm sure you know we'd all like to see more content from you, but we all know life's really that simple. So yeah, in the vein of Red Steel, I think, I think the videos that I'm most proud of that I've recently made are probably Africa, Red Steel, and last year's Driver 3, and my probably my Game of the Year 2022 video. I think if you look at those four videos those are the ones that I want to steer the ship in the direction of. Um, and they aren't dramatically different videos to what I normally make, but like, I want to be on camera more. I think that was something that added another element to the Red Steel video. Um, and I want to basically feel more confident and feel more liberated to dip more into, you know, real art analysis and, and just sort of um, embrace my knowledge in that area in a way that I've often shied away from, um, in the past. And I think you can see, you can see how I talked about some of that stuff in Red Steel in Africa, especially, and Driver 3. So when it comes to steering the style of my videos, a little more artsy, a little more high concept, a little smarter, you know, um, I've, I've noticed over the last five years as I've been covering obscure games, a lot more other channels have been doing the same. Which, of course, that happens. And when I started, I was kind of one of the only ones doing it in this way, and now there's plenty of other channels doing it in this way. So for me, it's a matter of finding a way to stand out from those other channels and find points of difference uh, and create value uh, in my writing in ways that are unique and insightful and valuable for people listening, I suppose. I hope that made sense. Uh, thank you for asking the questions, Antonio and Nicholas. 
Uh, Ruth Knappman, hey son, it's always heartening to... <laughs> Here we go. Hey son, it's always heartening to me as your old man to see you twaddle away at your little games you got there for all the people in your computer. I love you very much, Sport, and would just love to know if you have a personal... If you have any personal favourite Mario games. Alright, lights out at nine, big cat. <laughs> Thumbs up emoji. Spoken before how I've never been a super big Nintendo guy, but my favourite Mario games, and the Mario games that I enjoy the most, are Mario Kart and Mario Party, socially. I think that Mario, to me, is at its best when it's just this bullshit RNG multiplayer shit show. <laughs> and Mario Kart and Mario Party, especially Mario Party, are incredible in that regard. You can, you can have a few friends over, you can whip out Mario Party, Kart or Mario Party, and those games just generate like bullshit RNG stories that you can laugh about and drink over, and it's a good time. So for me, my favorite Mario games are kind of the ones that aren't platformers, but you know, it is what it is. Thanks for the question. Giant Purple Pen 15, do you think the industry has grown too big to be receptive to AA game development? It seems like the indie scene has pretty much taken over from anything non AAA because the big players in the industry are solely focused on massive shareholder RRIs, giving people like Bobby Kotick another golden parachute. On the same note, do you think the term indie game has gotten way out of hand? Thanks for taking the time to answer our questions. Um. I think I'm probably a little more optimistic about this than you are. I think the AA scene has been replaced by the indie scene, like you said, but I guess I guess the, the term indie games has kind of become a bit meaningless because indie games are getting so big. Uh, I was at PAX Australia this weekend, and I was also at PAX Australia 10 years ago in 2013. Um, and looking at the indie games in 2013, it was very, very small scale, sort of or not too far above flash game tier of... Uh, production values. Often games were being made for phones and iPads back then, uh, and now we're seeing games that are on the scale of, you know, giant CRPGs, and, and there was a game called Broken Roads, I believe, that just felt enormous, and we're seeing stuff out of uh, publishers like uh, the guys that did New Blood. Are they called, are they called New Blood? I don't know. The people that did Dusk that those FPS games they're making, like, those are bigger than indie games kind of were in the past, and not too far off the scale of where AA games were in the past. I think when you look at how the industry evolved, we kind of had the indie game, we kind of had AA games on the PS2 uh, and PS1 and prior. You had a lot more regional specific games back then as well, so you had Europe only games and Japan only games that were smaller in scale. Um, and you, the way that it kind of looked back then, because video game development costs weren't overblown and big video games could be developed by, you know, two, three dozen people, uh, they could afford to make smaller games. Whereas now, to hit the front lines as a big AAA game, it takes hundreds and hundreds of people and millions and millions of dollars and it's a different sort of scene. So we had the indie game explosion with Xbox Live Arcade and Steam blowing up in the mid-2000s. Uh, and with that, alongside the sort of blowing up of budgets, we the, the industry shifted to either have really, really, really small games or really, really, really big games. And like you said, that double A midsection just kind of got, you know, obliterated by that evolving scene. Um, sorry to give you a history lesson here, but I think, I think now the indie scene has proven itself to be so profitable if it works out and the industry as a whole has grown to such an extreme degree, uh, in a monetary sense that it is easy to justify or easier to justify spending millions of dollars again on smaller games. So... Trepang 2 might be a good example. Like, that game feels like, you know, a double A game from 20 years ago. It, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And I think that a lot of um, genres are still yet to catch up to sort of where we were in the PS2 days. You know, we don't see a lot of arcade racing games anymore. And the indie scene, I don't think, has done a great job at filling that gap. And we don't see a lot of FPS games really anymore, single player FPS games, because COD has kind of taken up that whole space. Um, 
And I don't think that the big indie games are quite on the scale of production relative to the AAA games as they were 20 years ago. So there's kind of an argument to be made there that the indie space hasn't filled the gap, but I'm generally optimistic and I think that small games are getting bigger. That was a longer answer than I expected, but thank you for asking. It's, it's a really, it's a compelling conversation that I think. Sebastian Zavala, hi, what is the video game that reminds you of your childhood? The kind of game that you remember growing up with and that you'll always have fond memories of. Thanks. Pokemon Ruby is probably, I remember I, it took me a really long time to get to school in, in, when I was sort of really young. I, I sat in the back of my dad's car for like 50 minutes on the way to school and then 50 minutes on the way home from school every day and Pokemon Ruby kind of got me through those car trips. Um, so that kind of transports me back to that time in my life. And then the Tony Hawk games uh, are very, I'm very endeared to and Time Crisis 2 as well it was a game I just played a lot of. I would just play Time Crisis 2 over and over again because it made me feel really cool to shoot the gun at the screen. So thank you for asking Sebastian. Dylan Kelly, howdy partner. Howdy. Howdy, partner. <laughs> I've been on a kick of apocalyptic games recently, playing a modded Fallout 4 and Stalker Anomaly, trying to curb my excitement for Stalker 2. On that note, have you ever played any of the games in the Stalker series? Looking forward to what you've got in the video pipeline. Uh, yes, I played quite a bit of Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, and I think it's, I think it's a really, really, really cool game. Uh, I tried Call of Pripyat, and I didn't get super into it, but, um... I think that the Stalker games are quite something. I think they're kind of exactly what I wished the Fallout games were. Um, so, yeah. I, I, I don't have a lot to say about them, I don't think. I want to revisit them. It's been a very long time since I've played Shadow of Chernobyl. But um, I, know there's a, I know that there's a Stalker mobile game on J2ME. And, and it's first person and everything. It's one of the more impressive J2ME games. Uh, I've always sort of been meaning to check that out. But, um, yeah, Stalker's cool. I like it. Gaminel Games. I feel like we have shockingly similar taste in games, which makes me vibe with your videos really well. Kind of curious, though. I've always been obsessed with rhythm games, especially the PS2 era. Amplitude, Frequency, Guitar Man, etc. Uh, I know for a fact they don't really get high view counts, so not expecting a video ever, but just kind of curious if you ever had a rhythm game kick. And if yes, I'm curious what your favorite is. Thanks for the years of amazing videos, my dude. You the best. Oh, thank you. I was I was obsessed with Audio Surf when it came out. I was really compelled by Steam and indie games as a whole, uh, and Audio Surf grabbed me. I, I remember sort of getting really into it. It, it had this really cool um, online system where it had like leaderboards, and you could comment on tracks, and you could. You'd get notified when someone would beat your score in a track and then you'd go in and beat them again and then you'd shit talk in the comments on the track and it was a it was sketchy, but Audio Surf was really fresh and unique in a way that I don't think we really ever saw before like that. I know that Vib Ribbon did a similar thing by sort of algorithmically making levels out of music, but Audio Surf to me was the first time one of those games hooked me. Um and yeah, it was just fun. There was a lot of trash talk. It was just a, it was just a brilliant game at the time. I doubt it's aged very well. Uh, and I still haven't played Audio Surf 2, which sort of came and went really quick. Um, but otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm pretty partial to Guitar Hero. I think, you know, Guitar Hero is a lot of fun. I kind of grew up in the era of Guitar Hero, but I didn't own it at the time. Um, I think it would have been a a hard ask to ask my parents to buy a giant plastic guitar for, you know, over a hundred bucks. So yeah, thank you for the question. Robin Broberg, AFL management games video? Uh, someday, maybe. It's <laughs> The thing with that video is it's kind of tricky because there's only one official AFL management game. And then, and then there's just like a bunch of unlicensed stuff and yearly stuff. And when you think about um, what it would take to properly cover a management sim, you would have to play each one for quite a long time, right? You kind of, it, it takes a while to truly understand the subtleties and the weaknesses and the ways you can, you know, exploit a management game um, if you can. So on top of the, the challenge of picking out which management games are worth covering, there's then the challenge of playing each one for long enough to understand if they're good or not. And uh, because of that, and because like, 
you know, it's a hard sell to get people to click on an AFL games video, as my, even though I pulled it off. Um, then I've sort of been putting off the AFL management games video because of that. Um, but there's some indie AFL games coming out soon, which look cool. And AFL 23 came out this year, and it was a bit of a disaster of a release, but they've been patching it. So I've been thinking about doing a video on that. But yeah, nah, thanks for the question. John Rodriguez... What is it that you feel dictates whether you want to make a review slash retrospective video on a game or just stream it for yourself and your micro community? Micro immunity, rather. <laughs> Good word. Often, I, I, if I want to cover a game, I want to feel like I have something compelling or interesting to say about it, or if the game is complex and interesting uh, inherently in some way that I think it's worth talking about. Uh, and when it comes to streaming games, often the games are a lot simpler, and I'm just sort of happy to jump in and dive around and noodle around on the stream. Uh, and that's kind of the distinction I've made in my head. Um, uh, with, with, like, with streaming, I often just kind of pick a game randomly five minutes before the stream starts, get it running. And you can probably tell because half the time it doesn't work, but <laughs> I do test it. It's meant to work. Um... But yeah, streaming's like, I'll pick a game five minutes before it starts and just go and have fun with it. And stream's all about just noodling around and chatting and having fun. Uh, whereas a video is like, you know, I, I, I want to I wanna have something interesting to say. Thank you. Uh, Sam Sneed, would you consider reviewing Gungrave games? The first game had character designs by Yasuhiro Naito, who made Trigun. Uh, a new game just came out a year ago, and it looks like the kind of jank that might interest you. Uh, I played that game a year ago. It was on Game Pass, and I I wasn't super impressed. Um, I think it just kind of felt very, very, very one note. Although it, it was kind of a double A game, returning to that previous question. It was kind of a really cool uh, example of a good double A game. But anyway, yeah, I tried it, and I didn't think it was very fun. I thought it was very repetitive, but... I really loved the assets. I loved the aesthetics. I loved the sort of um, commitment to being that sort of uh, cheesy, fun vibe with great character designs. And yeah, it, 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 it did make me want to go back and play the PS2 game or the PS2 games. I think there was two of them. Um, so maybe, maybe there's a video on them. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably go back and play the original Gungrave games sometime and then make a call on whether I want to make a video. And finally, final question from Siren Songs. Uh, I've been looking for good beat-em-ups. I still haven't found one that hits the same as Castle Crashes, the vibes of shooting rainbows and stuffed animals to melt health bars and destroy armies of skeletons is impeccable. Uh, do you enjoy the genre of beat-em-up slash hack and slash? Uh, do any games spring to mind that can give you that can give me the Castle Crashes slash Sailor Moon type vibes. Um, I'm probably a little young to have been around during that like late 80s, early 90s heyday of Final Fight and Double Dragon, but I do really like those games. Um, and, and that's the first, they're the first two franchises that come to mind when I think of beat em ups that are fun. So I guess if you haven't played those, like go and track down the arcade versions of, of, of Final Fight and Double Dragon and just noodle around in them because they're really fun. Um, the latest Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game is really good. Uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is quite good too. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not a genre that I've super dived into. I can't, I can't come at you with like a really obscure, interesting uh, recommendation <laughs> for that franchise. Um, no, for that genre, sorry. It's been a long day. Um, but yeah, like, I, I guess if you separate Hack and Slash out to sort of the God of War-esque Hack and Slash, there's a lot of those that are quite fun. But I can't think of one with like a Castle Crashes, Sailor Moon type vibe that works really well. Uh, I want to recommend... If, if you are looking for like a God of War style hack and slash, then Marlow Briggs and the Mask of Death is a really fun sort of B-movie-esque game. Uh, the Lord of the Rings games on PS2, especially 2 and 3. In fact, only 2 and 3. Ignore number 1, that's a weird game. Um, is pretty good. The old God of War games are pretty good. Uh, Wolverine Origins is excellent. Um, when it comes to beat-em-ups, another game that I think of is a game called Little Fighter 2. And it's a game that... Uh, it was developed in Hong Kong. Uh, it's one of it's 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 a game of the Y two K era. I think it's an online free, side scrolling co op, uh, beat 'em up game. 
with lots of powers and no balance and really snappy controls and simple pixel art. And uh, that game was a bit of a blast uh, from memory. I haven't played it in like 20 years, 15 years. <laughs> but at my primary school, everyone was playing Little Fighter 2 for a bit there. Um, and so when people mention like the side-scrolling beat-em-up, I always think of Little Fighter 2 and I'm like, you know, I'm like, man, I should talk about Little Fighter 2 when we're on this topic. But then I kind of remember that no one else knows what Little Fighter 2 is. Um, but it, it, I think people that were around and terminally online in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s probably remember it. Probably. So, I don't know. If you're curious for some sort of... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. This isn't really a recommendation because I haven't played it in such a long time. But if you're curious for... A very Y2K era internet side-scrolling beat-em-up out of Hong Kong. Look into Little Fighter 2. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. And thank you everyone for the questions. Uh, yeah. It's been lovely. These videos are always really fun. I'll ask another... Um, I'll put up another post on Patreon soon asking for more questions for the next one. And uh, yeah, take care of yourselves. Goodbye. <laughs>